In this video, we will discuss Desvedan Todorov's essay, Structural Analysis of Literature. Todorov explains the structural approach to literature and shows how this approach works using the plot. He gives examples from Boccaccio's Decameron to demonstrate this. And finally, he summarizes ideas about how narratives work and how we can study them. When it comes to looking at literature, we can have two approaches, a theoretical one and a descriptive one. The structural analysis we are talking about here is mainly theoretical, meaning it is not describing a specific book. Instead, it sees a book as an example of a bigger abstract structure. The main aim is to understand this abstract structure, not to describe the specific book itself. So in this case, structure means something more like a logical pattern, not a physical arrangement. When we look at a piece of literature, we can approach it from two different angles, inside and outside. The structural analysis we are talking about is an inside approach. This means we are focused on understanding the inner workings of literary work itself. On the other hand, when Marxists or psychoanalysts analyze a piece of literature, they are not so much interested in the specific work, but in understanding the bigger abstract ideas like societal or psychological structures that are expressed through that work. This is both a theoretical and an external approach because it looks at broader concepts. A new critic's approach is focused on the inner workings of the work. The critic wants to understand the work itself deeply and their end goal is to explain the meaning of the work in a way that brings out its true essence even better than the work itself. Structural analysis is different from both of these approaches. We are not just looking for a plain description of the work, nor are we trying to interpret it in terms of psychology, sociology or philosophy. Instead, structural analysis is more aligned with theory and the study of how literature works which is called poetics. It focuses on the way literature is written rather than specific texts. It is interested in the potential ways literature can be written more than any one specific example. The goal is not to summarize a specific work, but to create a theory about how literary writing functions. This theory covers a range of possible literary styles and structures and specific works are seen as examples of these broader possibilities. In practice, when we do structural analysis, we do look at real works. This helps us build a strong foundation for our theories because it is based on specific detailed knowledge. However, this analysis will mainly reveal what a work shares with others, like studying genres or time periods, or even what it shares with all works, which is part of the broader theory of literature. It won't necessarily highlight the unique aspects of each individual work. So in practice, we are often going back and forth between general literary ideas and specific works. Poetics, the theory of literary writing, and description, detailed examination of works, work together here. Saying this approach is internal does not mean we are denying that literature has connections with other things like philosophy or social life. It is more about establishing an order. First, we need to understand literature on its own terms before we explore its... Todoro quotes a passage from Henry James's The Art of Fiction, where James describes novel as a living thing. In this part, a critic who uses terms like description, narration and dialogue is criticized by Henry James for two reasons. First, James says you won't find these elements in a pure, isolated form in real text. Second, he argues that using these terms is unnecessary and even harmful because a novel is a continuous living entity. The first objection is not really a problem when we are looking at things from a structural analysis perspective. We are trying to understand concepts like description or action, but we do not need to find them in a pure isolated state. 
This is similar to how in physics we talk about properties like temperature even though we cannot separate it from other qualities in an object. The second objection is even more interesting. James compares a work to a living thing, but this comparison is a bit questionable. In our bodies we have blood, nerves and muscles all at once, but that doesn't stop us from understanding and talking about them separately. So even if elements are together, we can still distinguish and talk about them individually. While James's first argument had a good point that we should focus on abstract categories, not just specific works, the second argument completely rejects the idea of abstract categories or anything that is not immediately visible. People often say that applying scientific principles to studying literature does not work because science is objective, while interpreting literature is subjective. However, Todoro thinks this argument is too simple. The level of subjectivity in a critic's work depends on their perspective. It is less subjective if they are trying to figure out the qualities of the work itself rather than its significance for a specific time or place. It also changes depending on what aspects of the work they are examining. For example, there are fewer debates about the technical aspects like rhythm and sound in a poem and more about the deeper meaning and patterns. In reality, no science, including social sciences, is entirely free from subjectivity. Even the choice of one set of theoretical ideas over another is a subjective decision. But without making these choices, we cannot make any progress. Economists, anthropologists, linguists, they all have to be subjective too. The difference is that they are aware of it and try to account for it in their theories. In fact, it is hard to argue against the subjectivity of social sciences when even the natural sciences are influenced by it nowadays. Todoro brings in an actual example of how the structural approach works in literature. The example Todoro gives is just to illustrate the ideas, not to prove them. Even if there are some flaws in the specific analysis, the theories explained earlier are not wrong. The specific literary concept Todoro wants to talk is about plot. While he does not, Todoro's aim here is to introduce some helpful categories for examining and describing plots. These categories can help us better analyze and discuss narratives. They include terms like action, character and recognition. These terms are like tools in our toolkit for understanding how stories work. Here is the plot of one of the stories from Boccaccio's Decameron. A monk brings a young girl into his room and tries to be romantic with her. The head monk finds out about this bad behavior and plans to punish him severely. However, the first monk catches wind of this and sets a trap. He leaves his room and the head monk falls for the girl's charms. Meanwhile, the first monk takes his turn at keeping watch. In the end, when the head monk wants to punish him, the first monk points out that he just did the same thing. The result is the first monk escapes punishment. This story serves as an example to illustrate the abstract structure of a plot rather than being a detailed analysis of the Decameron itself. If we look at the four plots Todoro brings in, we can see they share something in common. To express this commonality, Todoro uses a simple formula. X breaks a rule. Y in charge needs to punish X. X tries to escape punishment. Y however breaks a rule himself. Y does not punish X because he believes X did not break the rule. This formula captures the basic structure shared by these plots. This schematic representation requires several explanations. One, at first glance, we can represent the most basic plot structure using a clause. There is a deep similarity between the categories in language, like nouns and verbs, and those in storytelling that we should explore. Two, when we examine this narrative clauses closely, we find two main elements similar to parts of speech in language. 
the agents represented as x and y are like names of specific people they can be the subject or object of the sentence and they help us identify who they refer to without needing a full description the predicate which is always a verb like violate punish or avoid these verbs share a common trait they describe an action that changes the situation if we looked at other stories we might find a third part similar to the quality described by an adjective in language this part does not change the situation but tells us something about a character three actions like violate or punish can take on positive or negative forms so we also need a category for the state or condition with negation being one possible state four the category of modality is important too for example when we say x must punish y we are talking about an action that has not happened yet in the story's imaginary world but is still present in a virtual world andre jolles suggested that different story genres can be characterized by their mood for instance legends often have an imperative mood as they serve as examples to follow fairy tales on the other hand are often in the optative mood expressing fulfilled wishes when we say y believes that x is not violating the law we are using a different kind of verb believe it is not about a different action but a different way of perceiving the same action this could be seen as kind of point of view not only between the reader and the narrator but also among the characters six there are also relationships between the clauses in our example it is always a causal relationship a more detailed study would distinguish between different kinds of relationships like entailment something that naturally flows and presupposition something taken for granted like the potential for punishment seven when we organize a series of clauses it creates a new pattern called a sequence for the reader a sequence feels like a complete story this sense of completeness comes from a modified repetition of the first sentence the first and last sentences will be the same but with some variation like a different mood or status in our example punishment is repeated first with a change in modality then with a denial in a sequence with temporal relationships the repetition can be even more extensive 8 to go from the abstract structured representation to specific tales there are three ways first we can study the same kind of organization but at a more detailed level each part of our sequence could be treated as complete sequence on its own this does not change the nature of the analysis just the level of detail second another approach is to look at the concrete actions that fit into our abstract pattern for example we can point out the different rules that are broken in the stories of the decameron or the various punishments handed out this would be a thematic study third we can also examine the language used to express our abstract patterns the same action can be conveyed through dialogue or description using figurative or straightforward language Additionally each action can be viewed from a different perspective this falls into the realm of a rhetorical study these three directions align with the three main categories of narrative analysis studying how narratives are structured focusing on the themes or subjects and delving into the rhetorical devices used in storytelling there are three one might wonder what is the point of all this analysis The aim is not just to understand the specific stories in the Decameron. The bigger goal is to understand literature in general, especially in terms of plot. These categories of plot can help describe other plots in more detailed and accurate ways. So our focus is on things like narrative mood, point of view and sequence rather than any one specific story. we can start thinking about creating a classification system of plots it is hard to come up with solid hypothesis so todoro summarizes what he has found from studying the decameron the most basic complete plot can be seen as a shift from one stable state to another 
Here, Todoro borrows the term equilibrium from genetic psychology. It refers to a stable but not unchanging relationship within a society, like a set of rules or a social system. There are two moments of equilibrium, which are both similar and different, separated by a period of imbalance. This imbalance includes both a process of deterioration and a process of improvement. All the stories in the Decameron can fit into this broader structure. However, we can categorize them into two types. The first type involves avoided punishment, like the four stories Todoro mentions earlier. Here we see a full cycle. It starts with an equilibrium, gets disrupted by a rule being broken, and punishment would have restored the balance. However, since punishment is avoided, a new equilibrium is established. The other type of story, like the one about Emino, falls under conversion. This story begins in the middle of a cycle with an imbalance caused by a character's flaw. The story mainly describes a process of improvement leading to the removal of that flaw. The categories we use to describe different types of plots reveal a lot about the world depicted in a book. In Boccaccio's works, for example, the two equilibriums often represent culture versus nature, the social versus the individual. The story usually aims to show the superiority of the individual aspect over the societal one. We can even make bigger generalizations. We might compare a specific plot classification with a game classification and see them as two variations of the same underlying structure. However, there has not been much exploration in this direction yet and we are not sure what questions to ask. Now, Todoro returns to his initial question. What is the focus of analyzing the structure of literature or poetics? At first, it seems like the subject is literature itself or literariness, as Jakobsen put it. But if we dig deeper, we realize that in discussing literary concepts, we have had to introduce various ideas and form an image of literature. This image is the main concern of poetics. As Gassi put it, science is concerned not with the things but with the system of science it can substitute for things. Essentially, the qualities we attribute to literature only exist within the discourse of poetics. This does not mean that literature is less important for poetics or that it is not in a sense the subject of poetics. Science often grapples with this kind of ambiguity about its subject. Poetics, like literature, constantly moves back and forth between two aspects. The first is self-reference, a focus on its own nature. The second is what we typically consider its subject. The practical conclusion here is that discussions about methodology in poetics and in any field are not just a side note. They are at the core, the main objective. As Freud said, the important thing in a scientific work is not the nature of the facts with which it is concerned, but the rigor, the exactness of the method which is prior